Thank you all for coming. I, uh, this is a, an honor and a privilege for me to, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker. And uh, this year, the, the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement is probably celebrating its 10th anniversary. The CCE transforms student learning, deepens faculty engagement, transforms uh, uh, and partners with community organizations for social change by connecting U of R and Richmond communities in collaborative and sustained partnerships. Through courses, research projects, volunteerism, fellowships, discussion series, and reflection, the CCE brings students, faculty, staff, and community partners together to explore educationally meaningful approaches to community identified needs. Honoring their values of collaboration, lifelong learning, full participation and intentionality, the CCE is hosting a three-part speaker series titled Art and Science of Citizenship, Engaging Minds and Communities for Change, of which we take part. This series is designed to explore the multidimensionality of civic engagement in our society, uh, from the humanities to the sciences. Today we are excited to have, uh, to host Dr. Tundia Gardi, who leverages her knowledge and research in the sciences to lead a life of civic engagement and stewardship. Dr. Agardi is an internationally renowned expert in marine conservation. She specializes in coastal planning and assessment, marine protected areas, fisheries management, and ocean zoning. She founded Sound Seas in 2001 to, to promote uh, marine conservation. She is the director of the Marine Ecosystem Services Program at Forest Trends, which is a group that seeks to shift the economic paradigm towards recognizing the value in all natural ecosystems, connecting policymakers, businesses, communities, and investors to develop new financial tools to help carbon, biodiversity, and water markets work for conservation and sustainability. Her accomplishments in environmental stewardship are multiple. She earned a bachelor's at uh, Wellesley College, so is familiar with our liberal arts model of education, though she did spend time at that point, in, uh, during that period of time at Dartmouth. She earned a master's in marine affairs uh, at the University of Rhode Island, uh, focusing on fisheries management, and at the same time was working on her PhD, and earned her PhD in population biology and genetics of the leatherback sea turtle, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, from there, she uh, did a postdoc at Woods Hole Ocean Graphic Institute, and then served as a marine policy fellow for several years at, at Huey. Uh, in 1995, she was selected as one of the of Time Magazine's most promising young leaders in America. Um, during her graduate work, she led uh, an, an endangered species management program in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And at that time, I happened to be uh, an undergraduate studying abroad, uh, abroad in the, in the Caribbean. Um, it, it was abroad, but I was uh, uh, doing core work research at the West Indies Lab in St. Croix. And one night, we got this note that there was a conservation biologist who was working on leatherback turtles uh, who had invited our group of undergraduates to come down and, and see what was going on. And so we jumped at the chance to see these, uh, see these turtles, or at least this program, we weren't sure what we were going to get into. And uh, I would show you a picture um, to, to prove that this happened, but you wouldn't believe it's me because I have all this hair. <laughs> um, so I'll have, to, I'll have to show you. If you have an interest in it, come and see me. I'll show you later. Uh, but it was one of those really transformational moments for me because I got to see somebody who used science skills, or science skills, and a conservation ethos um, to really make a difference. It was a, it was a fantastic experience for me, and, and really to this day, uh, is something that I try to model and emulate. Uh, from these uh, numerous experiences engaged in conservation work and, and stewardship, uh, Dr. Gardi has led multilateral and multinational efforts in conservation. Um, she has emphasized an approach that provides opportunities from a broad conversation from many quarters, which is a perfect fit for our liberal arts model of education. Her lecture tonight is titled Ocean Commons, The Last Great Frontier for Civic Engagement and Stewardship. Please join me. And welcome in, Dr. Tim Yulard. So 
the only important part of the story that uh, Malcolm said is really um, the, um, the part of my background, I guess, that allowed me, or the opportunities, I should say, in my life that allowed me to uh, use my science to work in, in conservation. Um, one thing I want to say before I get into the, the meat of the talk is that I think there are a lot of different entry points for conservation. I think, um, you know, whether it's uh, a background in ecological sciences or population genetics, as it was for me, or whether it's uh, economics or law or business or uh, even the arts, there are a lot of different doors that enter into the world of conservation, and it's an important door to cross through. And I encourage any of you who have even the remotest interest in nature and in um, issues of sustainability and climate change and so forth to consider a career in conservation in me. So thank you for having me. And I'm going to be talking about something that I don't usually talk about. I, I normally kind of give a, a talk that's more along the lines of doom and gloom and talking about all of the ways that we humans affect the marine environment, affect ecosystem functioning, and affect um, the ability of the planet actually to sustain um, humans into the future. Um, I will be saying some of those things. I can't not say some of those things tonight, but I really want to make this talk much more of a, uh, a talk about the opportunities that present themselves today. Um, for changing the way that we interact with nature and um, kind of doing a course correction so that we can really guarantee our survival into the future. Humans and nature have had a very complex and tenuous relationship over the past millennia. Um, you can see from this image, I don't know if we can turn down some of those lights. Or maybe some of the, on the slides that you won't see a lot of slides that require careful looking, but just, this is an image of um, the world with the night and in the night sky, just to show the kind of transformations that have happened on the planet in terms of the amount of development that we've done. And you know, for many, many centuries, humans really considered nature to be their environment. Humans were a part of nature. Um, and then somehow in the last century or so, we developed this kind of view that humans were really apart from nature. And it was this struggle to either protect nature on the one hand or to utilize nature to the fullest on the other hand for human purposes. And we really somehow separated ourselves from nature. And I think now we're getting back to a situation where we're much more um, kind of realizing the, the intimate and um, you know, undeniable links that exist between humanity and nature. So how is that relationship pairing today? Um, I base a lot of my um, kind of appraisal of that relationship between humans and nature on work that was done for the Millennium Assessment in 2005. Um, I was lucky enough to work on that um, very, very large scale study that took five years to complete. It was an attempt to look at all of the world's ecosystems, and not just savannas and tropical forests and desert lands and uh, coastal environments and so forth, but also things like urban environments considered as ecosystems and agricultural systems considered as ecosystems. And all of these ecosystems were appraised um, to look at specifically the links between ecosystem health functioning and human well-being. Human well-being is something that we can actually measure. And so the idea was to appraise the condition of ecosystems around the world um, and then determine how that condition was affecting human well-being. And to do that, the assessment uh, looked at ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the things that nature provides to humans. Um, so they include things that we used to call goods. Those are provisioning services. So food, fuel, materials for building, like that. But then in addition to that, the things that nature does for humans that includes um, regulating the planet. So flood control 
and water cycling and climate regulation. Um, supporting services like soil formation and pollination um, and cultural services that include the values that we derive from nature that are aesthetic or recreational or spiritual. So the ecosystem assessment utilized a lot of people, a lot of time, and looked at um, all of these ecosystems across the world relating to those services and how humans fared because of the condition of those services. It was done at the global level, um, so across the whole of the globe using global da databases. And then in addition, they did sub-global assessments. And these were much more detailed assessments looking at the real life um, conditions for humans relating to how the environment in which those humans lived um, existed at that time. The other thing that the Millennium Assessment did was it tried to project out to the future 50 years. So not it, in addition to taking stock in, of the environments in which people live and from which they derive resources, uh, the assessment also tried to project out what the world was going to look like in 50 years' time. Not just in relation to these ecosystems, but also in relation to human well-being. So the key findings of the Millennium Assessment are a little bit sobering. <laughs> um, we have had dramatic change over the last, particularly over the last 50 years. Um, and this is across the board, <coughs> all ecosystems that were looked at. Uh, we've changed ecosystems more rapidly in the last 50 years than we have in the previous centuries. Um, that won't be surprising to you. Anyone with, who is alive today would recognize that to be a fact. And those changes are occurring largely to me in the growing human population. And as you know, our, our human population is uh, growing rather rapidly. <coughs> now, about two-thirds of the ecosystem services that were looked at in all ecosystems have been either lost or degraded. And this is expected to grow significantly um, in, the, in the coming um, 20 to 30 years, really, as the Millennium um, Ecosystem Assessment projected out to 2050. So the findings are um, caught the attention, not so much of people in the US. You know, this was not, a, the assessment was, um, caught the attention of academics and think tanks and so forth. But in other countries, um, particularly the countries of Europe and in Australia and New Zealand, uh, the Millennium Assessment really caught a policymakers' attention. And they started to think through, does it make sense really for us to be thinking about nature for what it does to humans and start to invest in the protection of nature as a kind of survival strategy for humans? And in developing world even more so. So in the developing world, what we see is the Millennium Assessment showed that developing countries, a lot of popular, a lot of the global human population is at great risk uh, because these the ecosystem services are being lost. One example of this um, link between human well-being and ecosystem service loss is losing the ecosystem services that help um, flood control and help buffer um, land from storms, land and human communities from storms. And if you look at this, this is a uh, projection of, um, or not a projection, but a graph showing uh, flood risk um, in places. Now, one of the um, most troubling factors is that we have not only a growing population in a lot of disaster-prone areas, but that um, the in-migration and the population growth in those disaster-prone areas is actually quite high. So we have a lot of people living in the most risky places on the planet. Um, and these places are increasingly more risky to live in because ecosystems are not there, natural ecosystems are not there to provide the ecosystem services of buffering land from storms, uh, ma maintaining water balances, so across the globe, we have a situation where both people and nature are being <coughs> squeezed. And for those of you that study ecology, you'll know um, Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. 
Um, this was um, something that was written a long time ago that started to make people wonder about what happens <coughs> when you have a lot of people using a resource <coughs> without controls, and more and more people are using that resource and um, in many cases over-exploiting resources. So we see in Garrett Hardin's example, he talked about the commons being pasture land and what happens when you have more and more sheep uh, uh, occupying this pasture land because it's open access, not control. More and more people run their sheep on the, on the land. Of course, soon the grass is all grazed down and the sheep can't be supported by the, the system any longer. So we see this kind of recurring tragedy happening in all kinds of biomes around the world. And essentially what we've created is a kind of vicious cycle. We start with resource scarcity, uh, and actually you can start at any point in this cycle. It's, um, you know, there's no really starting point or ending point, but it just keeps going faster and faster around this vicious circle. So we have resource scarcity that leads to competition for the remaining scarce resources. We create situations where there's wealth disparity, so those that can access the resources better and faster get to keep the wealth of those natural resources, and the left, the, the, those that are left behind are increasingly pushed into poverty. And then we see increasing conflicts, and increasing conflicts leading to more and more resource scarcity. So we seem to be in this kind of negative feedback loop, or, or I guess positive feedback loop, but in a bad way. Um, of not managing our impacts on the environment, not managing or controlling the amount of resource that we're extracting from the earth. So meanwhile, the situation at sea. Now, for years and years and years, decades in fact, people assumed that the sea was limitless. There were so many resources in the sea. It was such a vast area, it covers 71% of the surface of the earth, and 99% of the biosphere in terms of the living space on the earth is in the seas. And people just assumed there was nothing that humans could do to overexploit or degrade the seas. And the situation that we have today is um, troublesome. <laughs> we are finding out that in fact, there are many ways that humans impact the sea. We have massive amounts of over-exploitation of resources in some coastal areas. This is a picture um, that I stole actually from uh, Life Magazine. I don't think Life Magazine exists anymore, but um, fortunately Malcolm exposed me for how old I am. And back when I was young, Life Magazine existed, huge magazine, very large scale pictures. And I stole this from Life Magazine. Someday I'm going to get uh, in trouble for it because I don't know the photographer. I haven't been able to give credit to the photographer. But this is the mouth of the Niger River. Uh, and this is a, a bunch of people who are fishing on anadromous fish. Uh, anadromous fish are fish that um, are out at sea, but then they come up to rivers to up into rivers to spawn, much like the sturgeon here in the James River. And these people are fishing the fish before it's able to go upstream to spawn. And needless to say, this fishery has collapsed and does not exist anymore. Um, just one example of immense competition on an increasingly scarce resource. We currently have a situation in which only 5% of the inhabitable land on Earth, which is the coastal zone, so 5% of the inhabitable land is coastal, currently accommodates more than half the world population. And it's also the place where the population doubling rate is the highest. So we have immense amount of pressures on this very thin band of land all around the continents and around islands. Now, unfortunately, that thin band of land is also and the sea that's adjacent to it is also providing disproportionate amount of ecosystem services. A lot of the things that maintain life on the planet are coming out of coastal areas. So a lot of the services, the things that we value as humans, goods and services, so you know, fish and other kinds of protein to support human life, but also um, 
you know, the ability to um, transport goods through shipping, the ability to get rid of waste by dumping effluents into rivers and so forth. All of this is happening in the coastal zones in an area where there's an enormous amount of human population pressure. So what are the, re the ecosystem services that are being affected? Well, they run the gamut from um, waste management, which is what natural systems like wetlands, salt marshes, uh, mangrove forests, uh, seagrass beds do. So waste management or water quality maintenance, um, recreational op opportunities, providing nursery habitat for marine fisheries, a critically important component of coastal areas, and one that um, until recently was pretty much overlooked as being an important thing. When we think about the amount of money that's spent billions of dollars in commercial fishing operations, the vast majority of those fisheries rely on coastal nursery habitats of some type to support fish populations or crustaceans or whatever else is in the fishery. So um, wetland areas also provide filtration for drinking water, not salt water wetlands, but freshwater wetlands that drain into brackish water areas. Um, erosion control, fisheries, marine biodiversity generally, offshore energy, and so forth. So lots and lots of services are being affected by our activities. Now, not all the activities uh, are uh, in the sea or in the coastal areas. And that's one of the big thorny issues for marine conservationists is that a lot of the degradation of oceans comes from what we do on land. So a great deal of, for instance, pollutants come atmospherically into the ocean or come via rivers into the ocean. So it's not pollution that's originating from ships. It's not pollution that's originating necessarily from coastal cities. It's also pollution that's coming wind-borne or coming in through land-based sources of pollution. This is a horrible picture of um, uh, sulfites being loaded onto a ship in, on the Red Sea in Egypt. Huge, huge problem all around the world. In fact, the Millennium Assessment, the coastal chapter, um, identified one of the major problems with coastal ecosystems and ecosystem services and therefore human well-being to be the over-fertilization of coastal waters, so too many nutrients getting into the water. And this is a pic set of pictures from Ghana, um, where you see the water is very greenish, and there is so much human waste going into the water here that uh, this is for um, algal blooms, which then close down the fishery. They can't even fish, it's so, the algal blooms are so thick, the algae is growing so intensely in this, during these events that they can't drag their nets through the water. They just get clogged with algae, and so they, 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 their boats are um, laying on the beach for sometimes months at a time during these algal blooms. So, in fact, the coastal environment was quoted in the Millennium Assessment as being the most chemically altered environment in the world. So, and this is true in many, many parts of the world. Not only in Africa, but all over the world, developed countries and developing countries alike. In some cases, these, um, this over fertilization or eutrophication of water leads to dead zones. I'm sure you've heard about the dead zone that's in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, one year it was the size of Rhode Island and then New Jersey, and I don't know what we're up to now, maybe Texas, I don't know. But uh, it's a growing area where there's too little oxygen to support the normal um, sea level. Uh, we have an enormous problem all around the world with coastal um, development and the loss of coastal habitats. And um, this happens for a number of different reasons, for you know, living space, for resort development, for industry, and so forth. And one of the habitat conversion things that a lot of people don't think about, but it is a very important one, is the diversion of fresh water away from estuaries, which is also causing habitat modifications. So if you have a dam upriver that's uh, keeping all the water from flowing to the sea, your downstream estuary is going to 
disappear. It's going to become just another part of salt and co coastline. It's not going to have the characteristics of an estuary. And estuaries are critically important for a number of different ecosystem services. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Uh, we have a, fit, a problem with our fisheries in many parts of the world, with kind of something they call fishing down the food web, which is where we take the big fish away and a lot of the top predators that are maintaining ecological balances, and we slowly fish down the food web, going with less valuable, um, smaller fish until we pretty much cause the system to collapse. Now, a lot of people focus on fisheries as being the biggest problem in marine <coughs> systems, and personally, I don't agree. I think fisheries have caused dramatic changes to landscapes um, and seascapes, <laughs> but, uh, but the changes are often recoverable, and so for me, I think that the habitat issues um, some of which are related to fisheries, so there's a lot of destruction of habitat that's related to how we fish. Big trawls breaking the bottom of the sea, for instance, really causing changes to the habitat. But in many cases, we can stop fishing in an area and the fisheries will rebound, <coughs> the populations will rebound. So I, I see, uh, I think it's a very important problem to understand and to control, but I see, um, I, I see kind of more opportunities to get this right with fisheries than I do with some of the other more difficult things to tackle, like coastal development. We have a lot of cases where we have ecological imbalances, and I don't, I want to get to the hopeful part of my talk, so I know, I can see all the corners of your mouths are going down, and people are starting to slump in their chairs, and I promised you this would not be a doom and gloom talk, so um, I want to get through to the, to the good stuff. But I just want to mention ecological imbalances because it, it does um, speak to why it's important to understand the ecology of these systems before we can start to conserve them um, effectively. We have a situation where there's a lot of things that contribute to something that a lot of us value, which is sandy beaches in the tropics. And I say a lot of us value because enormous amount of world tourism and billions and billions of dollars are generated around the existence of beautiful sandy warm tropical climates that people go to to relax and unwind. And a lot of things contribute to the beach formation. One of the key elements is this guy in the corner here, the blue-faced fish, which is a parrotfish. When you take the parrotfish away from coral reef systems, you can get a situation where the parrotfish is no longer grazing on the calcareous algae. And parrotfish are one of these bioengineering miracles parrotfish will go around and eat algae that has calcium carbonate in it and excrete that calcium carbonate as sand. And parrotfish, can, a single parrotfish can supposedly, I don't know how they figured this out, but this is the calculation that has been quoted, uh, one parrotfish can produce a ton of sand a year by excreting it out the other end. So if that parrotfish is removed from the system, then you don't have the sand material that the currents can then carry and deposit on the beach. And beaches are, as you know, very dynamic things. So if the beach erodes away from a storm event or a wind change, there has to be sand available in the system to deposit back on the beach to have your beach there. So when you take the parrotfish away, and especially if you muck up the system by removing mangroves, as they did in Cancun, this picture on the, on the lower right, uh, you have a situation where you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You take the mangroves away because you think they're just smelly, malar malaria-ridden forests, wet forests, and you start to overfish the parrotfish, and lo and behold, all the resorts and all the money that you invested in your beach development place uh, start to be at risk from coastal erosion. So this affects resorts, but it also affects human communities all around the world when we start to tinker with nature and cause imbalances. Those ecosystem services don't flow as readily. I need to mention invasive species because uh, this is something that's changing the character of marine and coastal systems all around the world, uh, and actually aquatic systems and freshwater systems as well. 
Um, this is a picture showing um, the spread of a lionfish that came from the Indian Ocean. They're a, um, a very aggressive um, colonizer, and they'll come in and displace uh, native fish very, very quickly. The fish were released from an aquarium in, we think, in Miami or in Key Biscayne or someplace. Uh, 1992, so the first, the red dot in South Florida was the only presence of lionfish. Unfortunately, they didn't catch that, those two lionfish, and the next thing you know, by 2012, the entire Caribbean, and all the way up to Virginia, actually, and Massachusetts, I am surprised to see, um, had lionfish. So, very interesting. This, this is what we call an invasive species, so not only is it an alien species, or not um, indigenous species, but it is invasive in the sense that it's changing the biodiversity, ch displacing native species. So unfortunately we have a situation where we have a lot of this stuff going on simultaneously in the same place. So we have pollution, we have habitat loss, we have in ecological imbalances, overfishing, all of this happening at once, leading to cumulative impacts that are difficult to and all of that is happening against the backdrop of the great big game changer, which is climate change. So with climate change, we have warming going on. This is sea surface temperature. Uh, we have warming going on. We have sea level rise going on. Sea level rise is changing things enormously because it's affecting those transition areas like estuaries that are so important for delivery of ecosystem services and for supporting biodiversity. It's important because it's also creeping up onto coastal lands that are highly polluted. Most of our Superfund sites in this country are in coastal areas, and those Superfund sites are getting inundated by rising seas. That means that the release of those toxins, it's not just Superfund sites. A lot of our uh, coastal areas are highly polluted, so we're seeing as the sea rises, increase in pollution, that stuff that was locked into coastal lands getting into the ocean. Um, and then we have acidification, which I won't go into, but the seas are becoming more acidic than they were in the past, and that's affecting things like uh, bivalves, like oysters and mussels, and potentially um, corals as well. What we see is we see a lot of phase shifts in ecosystems. So we go from kelp forests to what we call urchin barrens kelp forests being very productive, very diverse, full of life, to areas where we get sea urchins and not much else. Um, we see multiple stressors in coral reef systems, including pollution, coastal development, destructive fishing, and climate change-related bleaching, leading from coral reefs into these algal-dominated systems. So basically, we have a mess. And the Millennium Assistant, uh, Ecosystem Assessment found that, you know, we've lost, and this is a very conservative es estimate, so we've lost 20% of the world's coral reefs, 35% of the world's mangroves. Um, we have a lot of water trapped in reservoirs. We have so much water trapped in reservoirs, you guys, that the actual spin of the Earth has changed. It has slowed down, and so we've actually increased time by, you know, a billion of a second or something, but the spin of the Earth has been affected by how much water we've trapped in reservoirs. Think about it, it's bizarre. Um, <laughs> we have estuaries disappearing and um, all over the place because of this diversion of fresh water away from estuaries. And we have uh, pollutant impacts, including these dead zones spreading all over. And we have, most of all, increased conflicts from scarce resources and competition for ocean space by different resources. So if we look at a graphic of that kind of um, vicious cycle that I talked about um, specifically for coastal systems, then you can see that you, know, you have habitat destruction on the coast, it increases sediments and pollution, that affects the coral reef offshore, the coral reef being degraded, uh, increases the risk of uh, coastal communities being affected by storm events like Hurricane Sandy. That didn't happen in the tropics, that happened here, but Hurricane Sandy equivalents in the tropics or things like tidal waves. 
It also affects the day-to-day -day stability of, of the coastline um, in many places. The coral reefs are a great buffer, and if you start to mess with coral reefs, you lose that buffer area. A decrease in tourism and a loss in, um, and a decrease in fisheries as well. However, I really believe, and I'm not just saying this because I'm trying out the new optimistic me, <laughs> as opposed to the pessimistic me of the past, but I really believe this. I think we can talk in the marine environment, not about the tragedy of the commons, but about the tragedy of the commons. And why do I think that? I think that because if there was any ever a kind of biome where the world had a vested interest in getting it right, the ocean environment. We have the ability, because we don't have private property rights in the marine environment, we don't have the people in power or people in wealth locking away parts of the ocean for themselves. We have a situation where the ocean is part of our, our, common, our common property, if you will, our common um, you know, source um, of all these services. So we have an opportunity to get it right, and we are starting to understand how important ocean functioning and healthy oceans are to human well-being. So governments really have both an opportunity and an obligation to protect those oceans as a commons, and I think they're starting to realize that. You see more and more General Assembly, um, you know, meetings at the UN starting to talk about the high seas, the areas beyond national jurisdiction, and what can be done to protect those. More and more um, agreements on common stewardship for the ocean. Um, and we have much, much more uh, engagement um, and opportunities for engagement by people of all walks of life that benefit from healthy oceans. So whether it's the youth, whether it's people who are tourists or recreate, uh, whether it's people who make their livelihoods on the sea. There is a lot more engagement now, a lot more <coughs> political will that's growing as well to do something about all of this ocean degradation. Um, I see really three developments that give me cause for hope. Um, one is that there's increasing interest in and even passion for life in the sea. Um, people like Sylvia Earle, we were talking about today, you know, are champions for um, the oceans and who have, you know, opened the world's eyes to what's going on with the sea. Um, we have, um, you know, more and more interest in thinking about the oceans as the last frontier where we can get it right. You know, we've degraded so much of land around the world. And I mean, here we're, you know, you're in a beautiful campus. This is a beautiful place. I got had the opportunity to, to drive around today and see some of the beauty around here and see how well managed it is. But, you know, this isn't the case in a lot of parts of the world. So we have increasing degradation all over the world. And because we have a lot of degradation, there's a lot of displacement of people from inland areas to the coasts. So we have the opportunity now. That door is closing on us quickly because there's more and more pressures on the coast. The second thing that I think gives us cause for hope is that there's more and more really bona fide protected areas that are being put in place by communities, by users of the resource, as opposed to being imposed by governments. Um, and then the third thing is um, something that I don't have time to go into because it's another lecture full of jargon and full of kind of policy wonk information, which is what's going on in the policy arena most coastal countries around the world, more and more countries are doing systematic planning where they're identifying areas to protect that need protection because of their ecological value and thinking about what uses to put where. And we call this marine spatial planning. Um, and sometimes those marine spatial plans result in zoning maps that are very similar to the kind of zoning that we do in municipalities or in counties. Um, in places like here in Virginia. So there's reason for hope. We are lucky because we have a lot of uh, marine species that are great flagships, that are kind of iconic species that symbolize what's going on with the oceans. You know, I don't think 
anyone can show me a person who doesn't love a dolphin, <laughs> or love to see whales, or love sea turtles, for that matter, um, or, you know, or like to go fishing, or like to go snorkeling. So we have, we have a human affinity for marine life that um, far exceeds, it's really interesting. Years ago, they did a study, they did a poll, and this is really a long time ago, about 19, 89 maybe, or 1990, they did a study of US citizens. They were trying to poll um, how people felt about the ocean. And the vast majority of Americans um, said that they really cared about the ocean. It was extremely important for them to know that the oceans were okay, that they were healthy and intact. And this was true whether or not they had ever even been to the ocean. So there were lots of people who were polled who had never, ever seen the ocean but for whom somehow it was important to know that the oceans were open. So with community-based NPAs, um, the reasons um, that these are such a cause for hope is because you know, we have about 4,000 some odd uh, marine protected areas all around the globe right now. So we have lots and lots of marine protected areas. The, most of those protected areas have been decreed by governments, have been imposed upon users, um, sometimes with very little participatory planning. Uh, you know, often it can be a presidential decree, often it can be a decree not only to say this is a protected area, but to say you can't fish here, or you can't, uh, you know, even gain access to the place. So, but that's the old way of doing things. And I think through years and years of doing marine protected areas and trying to design them in a way that they you know, lead to the outcomes that we want, which is healthy ecosystems that can be used by people uh, sustainably. After years and years of learning, we've learned that the better way to do marine protected areas is to work with users, to do it in a participatory way and he actually to divest a lot of the management of these protected areas to the communities or the users themselves. Um, we have to do that because governments don't have the budgets, they don't have the staff, uh, they don't frankly in many cases have the interest to really safeguard what we need to protect. And so um, with community-based protected areas, you can transfer some of that responsibility to the users themselves and um, have the participation, and that also creates a sense of empowerment, because many, many coastal communities, as I was saying this morning to the students I was talking to, around the world we see coastal communities are often the most marginalized people in society. They tend to be, they tend not to have a voice, and they tend to be ignored. Uh, the coastal resources are rich, so the government would, in many cases, prefers to exploit those resources and not care about the, the human well-being of coastal communities. So giving people some ability to participate in, in planning processes and in management of the areas where they live gives them a sense of empowerment and a voice that they didn't have. Marine protected areas can also create new funds flows, and I need to mention this because you know, we also are very limited in the resources we have for research, for monitoring and surveillance, so in boat patrols or uh, looking to see how many fish are being taken and what method and so forth. So we need new revenue streams to support effective management. We need to understand where pollutants are coming from so that we can control them. Uh, and all of this requires funding and marine protected areas can serve as a vehicle to generate new funds flows. And um, I've got some documents here if you'd like to look at them or I've got a couple of inputs. Um, on payments for ecosystem services, these kinds of projects that generate investment and revenues from the private sector given to communities that take a part in protecting um, these habitats for the ecosystem services delivery. So in a way, marine protected areas can be a real good foundation for stewardship. I do want to mention that it's really important that this kind of stewardship or community-based management be legally codified. Um, there are any of you that are, are legal scholars, law students, or um, it's 
really critically important. I worked years ago on a case in uh, Tanzania, on the island of Kemba, which is around Mafia Island. And there, the um, in the island of Kemba, there was a problem with dynamite fishing. So the communities got together and they set up a system, a park, which protected their reefs from people coming in from the outside and dynamite. And each of the fishermen uh, would volunteer for a day of patrolling. So they would volunteer their gas a lot, uh, for their boats and their time to patrol this protected area that they set up. And they had a very uh, detailed system of um, extracting, you know, extracting penalties from people that broke the law, broke the, went into their protected area and did the dynamite fishing. Um, so they had their system of penalties was if you got caught the first time dynamite fishing within this established park, which was demarcated with buoys, by the way, so you know, people would, would have seen where it was. If you got caught the first time, you got a warning. If you got caught a second time, you had to sign a paper given to you by the patroller that said, if you get caught one more time, the third time, you're out, meaning we get to confiscate your boat and all your fishing gear. So it was very straightforward. And some group from Tanzania mainland came over and decided to test the system. So they dynamite blasted the reef. They got stopped. They got a warning. Second day, they came back. They blasted the reef. They signed the paper that said they understood. Third day, they came back, blasted the reef. The community took the boat and confiscated the gear. The fishermen went back to port in Tanzania on the mainland, <coughs> and they sued the community for $40,000, which is much more than the community had. <laughs> and the reason for that is because it was not legally codified. It didn't exist on the books in Tanzanian law that this protected area was there. So while this community-based management is really, really important, and it's a great source for um, managing seas effectively, it has to be recognized by law. And so that's why we need you know, lots of lawyers working with conservation biologists and ecologists and economists to be able to design these tools um, in a way that they can um, withstand you know, these kinds of uh, incidents. Just a quick note about uh, marine spatial planning and ocean zoning. You know, this is something that's really unfolding right now. This is like hot off the presses, very exciting stuff. And virtually every coastal country in the world is now doing some kind of ocean zoning or spatial planning. Um, it allows us to really figure out with the information we have today, what's the most important area to protect ecologically speaking? Where are the places that we need to limit uses? Um, sometimes that protection means limiting, trying to limit pollution, for instance. It's not necessarily extractive <coughs> um, And then where can we allow, you know, more potentially destructive industries to operate? Where can we put shipping lanes? Where can we have, um, you know, power plant effluent discharge um, areas and so forth? So it's a way to systematically look at the system, understand it, and um, use it in the most sustainable way. And there is now community and user engagement in these planning processes, uh, which is something really new. So we have fishermen, commercial fishermen actively engaged. We have um, tourist operators. Uh, the lower left-hand corner is in Greece, where you have uh, the Greeks are not known for um, really liking very much government intervention. So now the Greeks are doing their own kind of system of protected areas, and the government is trying to catch up. Um, in Fiji with um, you know, people who look, rely on mangrove systems for um, their, their survival and livelihood. Um, all, the, all of these places, people are taking part in the planning processes, helping decide where there should be protected areas, where there should be um, industrial uses, where there should be other kinds of uses. And so we have a situation where this vicious cycle is now kind of broken. We're starting to see this all around the world. We're starting to see sustainable management. A lot of this is community-based. We're starting to see a lot more cooperation between different user groups, between different levels of government. 
sometimes between different neighboring countries that share marine resources or share ocean space. Uh, we see greater equity and less wealth disparity in these coastal communities where this kind of uh, management is going on. We see a lot of improved human well-being, so longer, happier lives, healthier people, less stress, um, and in many cases, people being lifted out of property, and less conflict as a result. So for that reason, I'm really hopeful. Now, a lot of these examples where we're seeing the, the, the positive cycle, the good one happening, are small scale, admittedly. You know, we haven't seen this in a big transformative event where we're all of a sudden seeing a country manage all of its marine resources effectively, manage its land use effectively so it doesn't degrade the marine environment. But the small scale examples can be scaled up. And I'm really, really confident that we're going to get there. And the way we're going to get there is with all of the next generation. I get to pass on, throw down the gauntlet and to pass it on to the next, all of you in the next generation to, uh, to carry on. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. develops a 
a wetland area, they have to protect or buy up and protect another wetland area that's equivalent and some. You know. um, and so we have, um, so a private landowner who happens to own a wetland could set up, sell a piece of wetland for a cool mitigation event. Uh, we have biodiversity offsets for other things too. So we have biodiversity offsets relating to loss of biodiversity. Where you have, for instance, the UK has a, a known net loss of biodiversity law, much like our wetlands law. If a development causes the loss of some species, they have to invest in equivalent and plus some in another place to offset that. Now, a lot of people, I should mention, have problems with offsetting because they think it's a license for destruction. Uh, you have to understand that offsetting doesn't allow, it doesn't help you get a permit to destroy the environment. Offsetting is only the last resort. It's once every other hurdle has been cleared and you, you know, you've done everything possible not to impact the environment. If there is some impact, then that is offset in this way. Um, so there are mechanisms um, by which uh, a private landowner could start to generate some benefits for protecting uh, even today in the U.S. And I think more and more of this will happen as we pass more and more laws that stipulate how much degradation are we willing to accept. Anybody else? You're looking, you're looking as tired as I feel. So. <laughs> Thank you. 